little bit different. Um, it's not necessarily something that I'm going through, but I want to challenge you with something that I'm reading. I'm reading a book called Tortured for Christ. Tortured for Christ. I, so I, was, I tend to go through Ms. Linda's library and find all kind of goodies. <clears throat> she knows how to pick a good book. And I was going through her library in the office there, and I came across this. And it amazes me um, the things that people went through for the cause of Christ. And it made me think a little bit about our society and where we are in America at without very little external pressures. There's nobody beating us. Um, there's nobody really torturing us. Um, in comparison to even the times when the disciples were around looking at the Roman culture and the different cultures, we got it pretty good, don't we? We, we got it real good, as a matter of fact. But yet, you know, we, we have... Extremely high education. We have great paying jobs. We have so many things that would be considered, you know, we're doing really, really well. And it seems like the, the, the better we're doing as a culture, the worse the culture gets. The farther, it's like that the better we're doing on a financial basis, the better we're doing on an a emotional basis, it seems like the farther we get away from God. And in reading this, it, it just blew me away when I'm just looking at some of the stories. And it was one in particular that really, really, it, it just blows me away when I, when I look at some of this. And I'm gonna, I want to, I want to read this one for you. This couple was unspeakably happy to hear from me that they had believed rightly that in heaven. There's really a nobody. Just think about that statement. There's really a nobody. They, he was very excited that here in this country in Romania, in this godless society, they believe in a nobody. Here's how they got there. It says, once we worked on a statue of Stalin, doing the work, my wife asked me, how about the thumb? If we did not have an opposing thumb, if our fingers were like our toes, we, we could not hold a hammer, a mallet, a tool, a book, or a piece of bread. Human life would be impossible without this little thumb. Now, who made the thumb? We both learn Marxism and Marxism schools and know that heaven and earth exist by themselves. They are not created by God, so I have learned and so I believe. But if God did not create heaven and earth, if He created only the thumb, He would be praiseworthy for this little thing. If He only created the thumb, they've been trained that there's, there's nobody in heaven, and you know He did not create the earth, but if He created just the thumb, he would be praiseworthy. We praise Edison and Bell and Stevenson who invented the electric bulb and the telephone and railway and other things. But why should we not praise the one who has invented the thumb? If Edison had not a thumb, he would not have invented nothing. It is only right to worship God who made the thumb. The husband became very angry, as husbands often would do when their wives tell them wise things. Don't speak stupidities. You have learned that there is no God. You do not know if this house is bugged. We can get in trouble. Get into, get into your mind once and for all. There is no God. In heaven, there is nobody. In heaven, there is nobody. Get it in your head. She replied, this, is even, this is an even greater wonder. If in heaven there is an almighty God in whom in stupidity our forefathers believed, it would then be only natural that we should have thumbs. An almighty God 
can do everything. So he can make a thumb too. But if in heaven there is nobody, I will worship with all my heart the nobody who has made the thumb. I will worship the God who has made the thumb. He, they, they are learning this under oppression. They are learning this where they have been trained and taught that if you believe in God, I will kill you. If you, if you continue to profess And he said no. And they talk about how they tortured this man. They tortured him and tortured him. And he would not break. So what happened? They go and they get his 14 year old son. And they said if you do not renounce your Christ. We will beat this child to within every inch of his life. And he says no. I can't do it. So they begin to beat this 14 year old child. And finally the father says, son, I can't tolerate this anymore. I'm going to tell them what they want. And this is what the 14 year old son does. says. He says, dad, I would not have you as my father a coward. And when I believe so strongly in my God, don't you dare say a word. And they pounced on that boy like they did Stephen when he began to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only real one that has come and has professed and proclaimed and he has saved us. Now it wasn't in Moses, it wasn't in Buddha, it was in Jesus Christ. So here we sit in a very prosperous country. We don't have anybody looking over our shoulder telling us anything different. We can go to church, we can listen to music, we can do anything that we want to do. But we find it very difficult to praise God even for our thumb. I think it's interesting, church, that whenever God wants to use somebody greatly, what does He do? He lets them go through a hard time. Yes, right. I want you to think about the best growth you've had spiritually. Mm-hmm. I want you to think about how you grew from a baby in Christ to a toddler in Christ to a knucklehead on a boy or a girl in Christ to even a level of maturity in Christ. I want you to think about it. I can almost put my finger on it. It's when you went through a hard time that you had to trust in God and God alone that you grew up and you grew strong and your faith grew and you grew closer to God all because of tests and trials and struggles. Anybody there with me tonight that you can recognize the fact that it was in those moments where God began to press you and God even allowed you, check it out, to be exposed a little bit. Mm-hmm. When God said, you know what, you ain't got it all together. Yeah. Like you say you do. So let me help you out. I believe God is putting some of us through a purification process. He wants us to be right with Him. He wants us to grow up and to lead others. He wants us to one day write books and tell stories that in a world where everyone was focused on money and cars and being successful and living their lives for themselves and gaining all they can and then sitting on their can, that there was a people that said, I'm going to praise God even if i got to look at the fact that i got a thumb. And you and I have more than a thumb to look at and recognize. You and I have more than a simple thumb. Think about your life. Think about what God has done for you. Even in the middle of your difficult times. Did He give up on you? Did He turn His back on you? Well, in thinking about this and preparing for tonight, one of the things that just kept running through my mind 
was this. God, when did I really get close to you? When did I grow in my faith? And it took me to Exodus chapter 1. And this is what it says. Starting at verse number 8. Now a new king arose from Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier of the sons of Israel and are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply in the event of war. They also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to inflict them with hard labor. And they built uh, for Pharaoh storage um, cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the Israel, of the sons of Israel. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of, of Israel, the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made themselves, the, listen, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor and mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field and all the labors which they rigorously imposed on them. The harder they worked, the more they went through, the stronger they got as a people. Why? Because they were not dependent upon their natural abilities. They were not dependent upon their past histories. They said, God, we are going to die if you don't help us. God, I will collapse if you don't come to my rescue. This thing is pressing it on me. I feel like I'm going to cave in. But God, I am trusting in you. It's when God allows you to finally get to a place of frustration. When He allows you to have all your success. But you finally hit a spot that success does not work anymore. And people don't work anymore. And you become so frustrated that you have to turn to God. And I want you to think about it. How you were relying on God through the most difficult time in your life. The most difficult times in your life is when you hit your knees the most. It's at a point of desperation when every phone call you made, they did not answer. Who do you have to turn to? God. Church, we're looking at this society that we live in. Are we really prepared spiritually to handle what's coming? Are we really prepared to deal with what will happen with this our great country? When it is driven to its knees? What's going to happen when we don't have the great pleasures of life? What's going to happen when the cable goes out? When the air conditioner goes out. Lord help us. <laughs> What's going to happen? I want you to think about this. What's going to happen when as, as the breadbasket of America continues to dry up. What will really happen if God allows this particular hurricane to really hit New York and to devastate our financial district? What would happen to us? I want you to think about that a minute. We are so comfortable. We are so comfortable. And our faith really doesn't cost us anything. Except the tithe every once in a while and some time on occasion. It really doesn't cost us anything, but what would happen? What are you going to do when this next hard thing hits? I just want to remind you that these people were in a time that it was illegal to talk about God. It was illegal to talk about Jesus. It was illegal. And if you talked about it, you were imprisoned and tortured and beaten. 
and murdered even. All because of your faith. We have nobody challenging us in our faith. And we got a hard time serving it and doing it and carrying it out. There's one other story here that really touched my heart. He says he was on the street and he was getting on the train. And as his custom was, he just would start a conversation. And he asked this woman, he, she, he said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And he ran, this woman ran up to him and kissed him. Here he is a preacher in the middle, middle of the square. And this woman, he don't know, runs up to him, grabs him, hugs him, and kisses him. And he's pretty embarrassed because you know, he got his collar on. He goes, what are they going to think? So what does he do? He grabs her back and kisses her as if they are relatives. And she goes on to say, I don't know your Christ. But I only know the name Christ. When I was growing up, all I had was pictures. And we, we were able to look at a picture and based upon our pictures is where we got our, our revelation of things. And she says, all throughout my childhood, I saw my mother bowing to a picture of this Christ. She didn't talk about him, but I would see her bow to this picture of Christ. So I don't know what Christ looked like. I don't know what Christ did. All I know is I saw my mother bow to that Christ. Which reminds us of the fact that every knee shall bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord. Here's somebody that's never seen him, never. And how you're carrying yourself. 
during your church time that determines if they decide they want to follow Jesus or not? What if all they got is your thumbprint? How you live your life on a daily basis? How you carry yourself in the face of obstacles and trials and temptations the way you walk with God? Maybe that's all they got. That's a pretty big challenge. But guess what? That's what the church is facing today. When all hell breaks loose, and it will, it is, people are going to be looking to the church. They're going to be looking for somebody that is willing to stand and say, you know what, this don't look good right now. But my God, my God is able to carry us through. We're going to come on the other side of this, but in closing, I want you to grab hold of this, please. It's very few times that I can remember in my life that God changed my situation. Most of the time, God changed me. He didn't remove the nobody. He didn't kill him like I asked him to. I don't know why not. He has not even moved morning close to the afternoon. He, I've been asking for years to do that. He's not doing that. He's changing me. And something you've got to understand, church. God has given us opportunity right now when it ain't so bad. To practice. To develop our character. To develop fortitude. The ability to stand up under pressure even when it hurts. I'm not going to preach to you a message that things are going to be easy and rosy and everything else because I know it's not. I'm not going to sit there and lie to you, but I'm going to tell you that during your tough times, just remember, let me go here. How many of you remember somebody? You got somebody in your mind right now that you watched go through a difficult time. Anybody got somebody in your mind? You watched them go through a difficult time. You, you got somebody that? My mom, I watched her suffer. That's right. Did she, did she complain? No. How did she go through that? Suffering. And where was her focus? Was it on her sickness? No. What was that? I don't know for sure. Not sure? Right. But you didn't hear her complaining, did you? No. Who else got somebody in mind? I saw Jordan, I got Granny, Desi, and Megan. This is what Jordan took in first. Um, my Nana. Yeah, How did she go through? Just smiling, always praying, singing, praising to God. I'll be taking notes on that. <laughs> I've been taking notes on that. Christy, who's your name? Lisa Gillespie. I went here when she lost her mom. I mean, when she lost her dad, but she lost her mom like six months later. And instead of backtracking, she just got stronger and stronger in the Lord, and her anointing increased. Please take notes on these people, Greg. Uh, Betty Riley, Jerry's wife. Mm -hmm. uh, she went through a tough time when she worked for me when I was accepted. Mm -hmm. And I give her a tough talk. She just walked. That's right. That's right. Yes, I did. I walked her walk. Anybody else? You, you watched somebody pass through this? My wife, when she was poisoned. There you go. <clears throat> she suffered for years. I want you to get it, church. You, you, you have to grab this. My wife just asked. The question about, about a book, and she's not feeling well. I said, just, just stay home. She's trying to get back. I said, just stay home. We'll pray for you. Just don't put this sneeze in the sky. I'll let you <laughs> stay home. But she was, she was asking me about a book when bad things happen to good people. And I remember reading that book, and I remember 
the, the Jewish priest that wrote it. And this is what he said. He says so often when, when, when Christians go through things, people that are really not spiritual and in tune with God, what they do is they pass judgment. They make statements like, man, if they say, if, if they were a real Christian or if they just had enough faith, they wouldn't be going through that. Right. And he was like, that is ridiculous. Right. <laughs> My Bible tells me that the more the Jews were afflicted, the stronger they got. Now, I ain't saying nobody signed up for a real hard job. I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm not telling you to get in line for the next difficult challenge that's coming down the pipe. But what I am encouraging you with, if an entire people that was oppressed up under Russian, the iron fist, could come to know Jesus Christ in great numbers, when they have working against them, not only a non-Christian history, but the threat of death. And go through it. And come out and testify mm -hmm. of the goodness of God. What about us? So I just leave you with one question, one, one simple question. What does serving Jesus mean to you? What does it really mean to you? It's challenging me. That question is just challenging me. I know that I'm in the will of God. So I don't question it. But I question, am I close enough to him? If a real hard thing comes, will I quit? Do I have open doors that the enemy can come in and distract me? This is what I'm asking myself. Now you come up with your own questions. Is there anything that I would want in this world more than my relationship with him? I had to confess to my boss a couple days ago. I'm getting to know Jesus even after 43 years of living, knowing about Christ since I was five, six years old. I'm getting to more know Jesus in a different way now than I ever had in my life. Yes. Yes. Amen. And I'm grateful. So I guess she's right. Whatever that pastor's going through, he don't preach about it. Yes. But I'm glad I'm preaching about knowing more about Jesus Amen. than worried about my bank account or pity parties or anything else. That's right. I'd rather really preach about the sufferings of Christ and how he's taken us through than to tell you that if you do this, this, and this, you will have all the money in the world without be lying to you. I'd rather tell you the truth that your lives are going to be difficult. And Jesus, in John chapter 17, even stated that they hated me in this world. They were going to hate you, but chill out. I'm praying to the Father, not that he take you out of this world, but he sanctified you. Amen. That's right. And that is what we're believing God for. That you, as you face whatever you're facing in life, will just be more sanctified. That, that Romans chapter 8, 29, 28 and 29 will come to life for you. That not only do all things work together for good, but it works together for good. Why? So that you'll be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Yes. Right here. Father, thank you for allowing this Romanian pastor to write this book and to challenge me. Thank you, Father, that I live in a time now that I'm not being tortured. 
Thank you, Father, that I live in a time now that I can go to church when I want. I can worship you when I want. I can listen to whatever music that I want, God. That I don't have anybody leaning over my shoulder, threatening me. All because I want to serve you or know you. So thank you, God, that, that you allow us to live in this time. That we don't have to imagine what you are like. We can feel your divine presence and we can read in your word and know you on a personal level. We thank you, Father, for those that are going through. We ask you, O oh God, to touch Eddie Bradley's body. We ask you, Father, to let the doctors find out what's wrong. Prescribe the right medication that his body can be touched. Dispatch your angels all about him and let your healing virtue flow through his body in the name of Jesus. You are the healer. We pray for Kendra, God, and the sinus infection that has her soul knocked down, God. Touch those sinuses in the name of Jesus. We pray for Christopher, God, as he is going through some challenges in Tennessee, and we ask you, O oh God, that you will direct his life. Help him not to lean to his own understanding, but in all his ways, in all his ways, acknowledge you, and you will make his paths straight. You will work them out. We pray for the Diamond family, God, as they continue to just be challenged in their situation, God. We pray for Christy Ray God, and, and, and her transition. We pray for others in this room, God, that, that may need a special touch from you, God. They're, they seem like they're in a desert place, God. They're, they're not sure where they're roaming to and fro from, but yet you are there, God. And we're reminded of the fact that as things got harder, God, you can only increase in our lives. It will turn to you. We thank you that you don't always just knock out problems, God, but you carry us through this. So whatever challenge or challenge we're facing right now, we're asking you, you be God, and we'll just be your children. You'll continue to see to our every need. You'll continue to carry us through every trial. You take us through every situation, even if it's misunderstanding, God. You'll take it, take us through it. We pray for the motives of the people of this church, God. I pray for those, Father, that might not understand the season that this church is in. I pray, God, that they'll trust you as we go through this transition time of increase in elevation and anointing, God. As our church purpose develops and as you show us, God, help your people to keep their eye on you. Thank you for the leaders of this church and for the leaders of this ministry. Father, we thank you for bringing the cold back to us, God. Whatever her needs are, God, help her to see you, have a face-to-face -face with you. I pray, God, that she will deny herself and take up her cross starting tonight, God, and decide that she's going to follow after you, not in her own mind, God, not in her flesh, God, but follow after you in spirit and in truth with everything that she has. And any other woman in this church, God, any other man in this church, God, that just might be at a place they're not sure, just remind us that the God who made the thumb has handpicked us for this situation. And that people are watching. And we are to let our light so shine that men may see our good works and glorify our Father 
which is in heaven. Thank you for giving us one more day. Just one more day. And we pray, Father, as we lay down tonight, that we can rest, that our bodies will be restored for tomorrow and whatever we have to face. That no matter how difficult it may look to us to realize you're there, you know about it, and you're carrying us through. And Father, anything that we fail in asking, please don't fail in giving. Because we do ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. I just feel that, that somebody right now might want to just touch and agree with somebody else. That what, what I was speaking tonight is it's, it's, right, it's for you. I know it's for me. I told y'all, whenever I get a spot, I preach my way through. Mm-hmm. That's just what I did. And I'm in a very good spot right now. Mm-hmm. But I want you to understand that because I'm in a good spot, my heart is open. Mm-hmm. Dead find that song. Sign flood, a heart like yours. <clears throat> Ever since, that woman always doing stuff to mess people up. Ever since she brought that song. It's just one of them that opens you up and helps you put your focus where it belongs. We, we have no creative ability to tell the words that we speak. Yeah. Yeah. If you can create words, if you can create atmosphere with the words that you speak, positive or negative, if you're going through a struggle, it might be a time that you begin to speak over yourself. And not speak what you want, but get the heart of God. Go ahead, Devin, play. Get the heart of God. Get the heart that says, God, whatever you want, I want. If you don't want it, you have the right to take it away. You have the right to take it away. Oh